We have just reached 20,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. And firstly, we are so grateful to everyone who has been so supportive. The comments, the questions that we've gotten, we love the community engagement and thank you so much. And to celebrate, we wanna give you 20 songwriting prompts you can use any day of the week. Doesn't matter if you're feeling tired or uninspired. Pull these 20 out, put them in your emergency kit, and this will help you get going with that song you're trying to write. So, 20 prompts for 20,000 subs. Thanks, guys. Number one, write the most cliched song you can possibly muster out of your sweet little heart. Literally Google cliches to avoid and then unavoid them. <laughs> Number two, replace the lyrics to a well-known song and then change the melody. Yeah, so for example... Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rise in a church where a wedding has been, lives in a dream. And then, should I do it like a different version? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm just going to make something up. Okay. Okay. Cooking and cleaning, being the wife that I wanted my mother to be. Oh, my oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for therapy. Woo. So now that I've got a super sexist lyric mm. from circa 1950, now I'm going to change the melody. Okay. <laughs> Cooking and cleaning, being the wife that I wanted my mother to be. Nice. Very 80s diva. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. Horrifying. Where is this coming from? I don't <sighs> Number three, do 10 minutes of sense writing. Now, I have talked so much about sense writing on this channel that I'm not even going to bother to do it here. I'm just going to point you to a video that you can watch to learn more about sense writing. Number four, write the chorus first. It's so typical, for me at least, and I suspect for a lot of people, to write the verse first. You know, mm. you're exploring an idea and mm. then you write the verse and you're like, what am I going to write in the chorus? And that's a completely valid way to write mm. a song, but mm. it's something really satisfying mm. about trying to write a really banging, memorable chorus first mm. and then from that central idea, thinking about what kind of stories yeah. could I tell yeah. that get to this idea. So it's like put the hook in first yeah. and then figure everything else out after that. The order you write it in isn't the order it has to stay. Totally. Number five is metaphor collisions. Now I'm going to include a link in the notes to an article I wrote on the blog that describes it in great detail, but basically it's this. You take two seemingly random things, smush them together in a metaphor and try to make sense of it. So for example, Give me two random nouns, Benny. Uh, pencil. Yep. Camera. Pencil, camera. So what I need to do is now think of a way that I can describe the pencil as a camera. How is a pencil like a camera? All right, here I go. Her pencil was a camera and the shutter speed of her memory captured the moment of her reckoning. Mm. Her pencil was a camera and the shutter speed of her memory was so fast and precise that it captured the moment of her reckoning with precision and with focus and precision. Yeah? Number six, spend five minutes listing stories you would write if the most important person in your life were guaranteed never to hear them. Risky. Heavy. Mm. Do you want to explain that one? No. <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. Seven. Pick up a different instrument. So if it's available to you to grab an instrument that's not your primary instrument that you usually write songs on, grab that instrument. The other alternative here is to do number eight, which is... Detune your instrument. Now, if you play guitar, this is easy. If you don't play guitar, you know, find your version of detuning. But here's a tuning that I've been playing around with that I've it? never used before. C, G, C, F, C, E. Uh, very popular with Nick Drake. Popular loves with tune. Nick Drake. <laughs> popular with Nick Drake when he was still with us. But this is beautiful tune. Now I've never played in this tuning and I spent two weeks during the holidays playing in this tuning just to see what I could get out of it. And what's beautiful about detuning is that you can actually try all your traditional shapes that you would normally play and get totally different results. Go on, give us a So, you know... Now, I don't know how I would play those chords in a normal tuning, but I'm going to have to work it out at some point. But the thing is, it really breaks you out of that rut, especially if you're getting sick and tired of your old chord voicings or just finding yourself writing songs that all sound the same. Detune your guitar. Mm.
Number nine, write a song in the future tense, which is all about future verb conjugations. Mm -hmm. This will happen. Mm -hmm. I am going to do this. Mm -hmm. The kinds of stories and um, emotions that are going to come out in the future tense are going to be totally different mm -hmm. to writing in the present tense or the past tense. And I think it's not something we would intuitively do by default. It's something we sort of have to decide to yep. do, but it's going to lead you down interesting paths that's yep. different yep. to anything else you would write on any other day. We pretty much always write past or present tense. Mm. And you realize when you start trying to write future tense, you sound like an oracle. Mm. Like, how do you know what's going to happen? So it's kind of an interesting experience and, and it can be a bit weird, but try it out and it, it does, it, you know, it does produce some very interesting results. Mm. A song that I think of immediately that does that in the first verse mm. is an older Dido song called The Day Before the Day. Mm. So the lyrics start out with speeches won't be made today. Flags won't fly. It's like all these things are mm. not going to happen. Mm. And it's really interesting to listen to that song and hear how all that future tense stuff, what that means in relation to what the song is actually about. So mm. check that song out. Great. Number 10, write in an odd time signature. We so often spend time in 4-4 four, four, or 6-8 or 3-4, you know, these are really common time signatures and they're beautiful time signatures. But again, if you want to try something new, break out of some old habits, try 5-4, try 7-8. See what happens when you, you know, have to phrase your lyrics and your melodies in these odd time signatures. And again, it will reveal some, some really great and surprising results. Number 11, write a two chord song. Now, whatever two chords you pick, you are allowed to play inversions and maybe some extensions and tensions mm. within those chords, but fundamentally you limit your palette to two chords only. Mm. Why is this a good thing to do, Benny? Such a great thing to do because if you know you can't change chords, you really have to find contrast and variation in other areas. So it makes you hyper-focused on your lyrics, on your melody. It, it, rhythmically challenges you to try and you know come up with some new things knowing that you've just got to stay with those two chords so incredible exercise and i also think it even focuses you on dynamics so mm. you sort of have to figure out performative ways to yeah. create the movement and journey that yep. makes it feel like the song is moving and going somewhere and not becoming overly repetitious and if you're someone like me who loves putting way too many chords in their songs this is a this is an absolute essential exercise to do like once a month just to reset and practice those other ways to make a song interesting you do like love a lot of chords. Too many chords. Too many chords. Number 12, write a song based on a color. So colors are interesting when you start thinking about what your relationship is with different colors. And some people even have different color associations with, you know, key centers. So for me, B minor, for some reason, is always this dark blue. I love thinking of B minor as dark blue. C major is always yellow and a particular kind of yellow. G is green. So if I'm writing in those keys, I'm generally feeling that color association as well. So you can do it that way, or you can interpret what colors mean to you. They mean different things to different people. Number 13, write a song in third person. So this whole idea of third person, first person, second person, it's all to do with what are the pronouns that you're using to describe the characters in the world of your song. So again, a default thing that most of us do if we don't think about it is to write a song either in first person, mm. which is, you know, I, 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 and if there are other characters, it's he, she, or they, mm -hmm. or direct address, which is where there's I, but there's also a you. So it's the first person pronoun and the second person pronoun. That's direct address. That's a very intimate, immediate, emotional, relationship-based point of view to write in. Mm. It's no surprise. That's actually the point of view that probably like 98% of pop music in any genre is written in direct address. Third person is something different. Third person is where you as the songwriter and storyteller are not a character in the world or story of your song. You are merely telling the story of other people, kind of from an objective distance. Mm. And again, it might not be as full of the kind of hot, passionate emotion of direct address, but that distance actually opens up other possibilities. It opens up other narrative possibilities and other thematic possibilities. Some of my favorite songs are written in the third person. And I will include a list of them in the link in the show notes below. Number 14, watch a television show and use the characters and the themes within that show as inspiration for your own song. I love this one because firstly, 
just at a creative level, mm. to me it's really nice to get out of my own head and get out of this compulsion to constantly excavate my own autobiography for material for songwriting. Mm. When you watch TV shows, the reason we love TV is because these are other people and other people's lives and other stories, but that have emotional resonance for us. And I like that idea of creatively bouncing off someone else's experience in life, but in a way that kind of sparks a feeling of um, resonance or a feeling of sympathy, mm. you know, that I'm like, oh, I relate to that emotion and that scene that has happened has mm. sparked the emotional memory mm. of something similar in me and using that as creative inspiration. It's also very good professionally as a songwriter. There's a whole professional world of writing songs that can be synced mm. to TV shows and films, right? So that's called sync or song placement is having your songs placed into visual media. Number 15, write a pure love song. What's pure love song? Yeah, so I think here pure love song is about writing a love song that's not cynical, that's not... I don't even jaded. Know, jaded. Yeah. But also the challenge here is writing a pure love song without making yourself feel sick. Mm. Yeah. Because the jaded part or the cynical part is actually, you know, it takes the edge off the nostalgia or it takes the edge off that sappiness. So we, we kind of default to that sometimes with love songs, but to try and write a love song that's just from the heart, it's honest, it's sincere, and not make it feel really sappy and over the top, that's challenging. You know what a great example of that is? Mm. The song Nothing by Bruno Major. Yeah, mm. totally. Check that out. Number 16, roll a dice. And whatever pops up, your job is to use that number in a creative way. So what's great about a random prompt like a dice roll is that if the number five popped up, you could talk about the number five. Maybe you have a relationship with the number five. Maybe you've got a cousin who's five years old and you want to talk about them. Maybe you want to set the song in 5-4. Maybe you want to create unstable structures in your verses and use, you know, five bar structures. It's totally up to you, but you've got to stick to that number and then think about all the different ways you can interpret that number. Number 17, write a political or protest song. What is a cause or an ethical concern or an issue of social justice that you strongly and passionately believe in? And how can you write a song that could actually be of use and of service to people who also passionately believe in the same thing that you do? The other challenge with this song prompt is how do you write one that, you know, acknowledges the nuance of a situation, a political situation. How do you write a song that doesn't just say, I'm right, you're wrong? How do you kind of make it feel a little more um, engaging of both sides or both arguments? Number 18, learn a chord progression from a song that you love and then change it in three different ways. What are three ways, Benny, that you can change a chord progression that you've mm. borrowed to make it your own? Okay, we can change the key. Great. Take the same chords, but put it in a different key. We can change the tempo. Or you could change how long you are holding the chord for. So if mm. the chords in your original progression are changing one chord per bar, you could make it faster. You could make it two chords per bar. Or you could do the opposite thing. You could mm. slow down that rate of change. So you mm. could actually hold each chord for two bars. Mm. Which interestingly enough, historically there are examples of this. So one that always comes to mind for me is that the song Come Together by The Beatles has exactly the same chord progression as the song Grapevine by Marvin Gaye. And there's interviews on the record with the Beatles where they talk about the fact that that's where they got that chord progression from. They were listening to Grapevine and thinking how cool it was. There's a particular chord move that really struck their ear and they were playing it and then they did a lot of these kind of tools mm. to take that chord progression and mm. what they loved about the moves between the chords, but to really make it their own thing. Mm. So, you know, mm. stealing chord progressions is well-worn territory mm. and something that lots of people do. If the Beatles do it, I'm going to do it. Totally. Mm. Number 19, write a song that is slower than 60 beats per minute or faster than 140 beats per minute. Why would we do this? When you try and write a song slower than 60 BPM, you find out how tough it actually is because 60 BPM or slower feels really slow. But the beautiful thing about a song that slow is it changes your relationship to phrasing. It changes the way you write the melody. You've got so much time in between downbeats you know, you're going to have to come up with some some really lovely melodic movement. Alternatively, when you're going at 140 BPM or, or higher, you really haven't got a lot of time. It's moving by at such a rate that you're starting to think perhaps more in shorter staccato phrasing. It just changes the way you approach melody writing uh, specifically, I think. 
most songs that you would listen to would be somewhere between 80 and 110 or 20 beats yep. per minute. Yep. So 60 is going to be drastically slower and 140 mm. is going to be quite significantly faster, mm. which just means you're going to be writing a song that is unusual for the marketplace and probably unusual for you, which is also really fun. And number 20, write a song with no rhyme scheme. So when you take away the need to rhyme, you can just focus on telling an intimate story in a more conversational language, really, because everyday language doesn't rhyme. So when we take away rhyme, we move back closer to the way we talk in an everyday kind of way, and it allows you to tell the story from the heart or the thing that's on your mind without worrying about any of the other stuff. I do find when I'm giving feedback to people's songs in the classes I teach or in one-on-one -on -one sessions, mm. sometimes when people have issues with lyrics, it often comes down to the rhyme scheme, the, the com compulsion or the mm. habit of constant rhyming. And often I find that people are kind of painting themselves into a corner. Yeah. So one of the big challenges that we both find with students is that they're trying to find a word that rhymes rather than find the word that actually expresses what they're trying to say. And so take rhyme out of the equation, train yourself to find the perfect word for that moment and don't be held ransom to you know the rhyme scheme and the need to rhyme. So there you have it, 20 songwriting prompts for 20,000 subscribers. We just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has supported us, communicated with us, engaged with us on the YouTube channel, as well as everyone who has joined our growing and wonderful community on Patreon. And thank you to everyone who has supported us with our Udemy courses and encouraged us to keep making those courses. We really appreciate all the feedback and all the input from you. And a final gift from us, you can follow the link in the show notes to download a free ebook of the 14 day songwriting challenge, which is full of amazing prompts and challenges that you can do on any day at your own pace. So thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.